Welcome, everybody, to this special edition of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast. Due to popular demand, I've gone ahead and combined all the scary as well as creepy cartel encounter stories that we've covered here on the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. This is into this one big collection episode. This one is great if you are a first time listener of this channel and you want to hear people's scary stories of encountering the cartel, as well as how they got out alive in some of these cases. Make sure to subscribe if you are brand new, and if you're an OG subscriber tuning into this episode, just know that we'll be back on the next episode with some brand new scary stories. Anyway, with that said, turn off those lights, get comfy, because we're in for quite the chilling tales. I do have to give a fair amount of warning for what I'm about to describe to all of you. This is a very graphic recollection, and what we saw on this day changed and scarred my cousin and I for life. This is your final warning for those of you who might be squeamish. So, let me take you back in time to the year 2014. I was living in Texas. And on a weekend, my family and I drove down to Mexico to spend a few days with my grandparents. A few blocks away from my grandparents' house was where my cousin Alejandro lived. For reference, I'm female, and I was 14 at the time. He was 16. It was a Saturday in the afternoon, and Alejandro and I played a little bit of football with some of the other neighborhood kids. That's soccer for my friends in the United States. After we had finished playing, there was, I'd say, 40 minutes of sunlight left. We were going to have pozole over at my grandparents' house, but we decided to first spoil our appetite and get some ice cream at a nearby ice cream shop. There weren't many people there, so we were in and out in less than 5 minutes. Now, in order to get back to my grandparents' house, we could take the same neighborhood streets we had walked on, approximately a 10 minute walk from where we were currently located. Or, we could take some back roads that take you into a forest-like area that eventually gets us back to my grandparents' side of the town. It's a bit more of a walk, and it's quite secluded the further you go in, but being the rebellious teenagers we were, we decided on going there nonetheless. I did at least make sure to let my parents know via my cousin's cell phone that we might be a little bit late. Anyway, we opted for that scenic route and we made our way into that wilderness area, making sure we didn't accidentally stumble into any rocks or trees. You see, a bit of bad luck for my dad, on the first day we got there, he ended up tripping and spraining his ankle, but this would be the least of our worries. Once we're a fair distance into the trees and away from the town, we began to hear what sounded like muffled yelling. Kind of like putting your hand over your mouth. That's the best way to describe it. This was kind of weird. And a bit creepy. You always hear stories about La Llorona and my cousin was trying to scare me as he said that she was coming to get me. But these muffled screams sounded very different. And not only that, this would soon be followed by a loud gunshot. Now, you'd think we would have booked it at this very moment, but we get curious and start to walk toward the sounds. As we got closer, as we could already see a bit through the tree line at this point, we can make out figures through the brush more clearly. First thing I see is a body on the floor and a bunch of blood pouring and oozing onto the nearby dirt. There were three other people on their knees with their hands tied behind their backs and black bags covering their heads. Next to them were three men. One has a handgun and the other two are holding assault rifles. I'm terrible with guns, but if I remember correctly, they were AK-47s. Anyway, my cousin now grabs me since I was standing there frozen in shock and he tells me to get down when in that very moment, Another one of those people on their knees is shot in the back of the head. They would then fall to the ground immediately. I did just mention how I froze. Well, for some reason, I just couldn't move at this moment. 
My cousin would relay to me that he whispered to me that we had to move. And before I knew it, I was snapped out of my daze when I hear one of the gunmen yell in our direction and ask who is there. No lie, it's like a switch flipped in my head and I realize what was going to happen if we didn't leave in that very moment. We would have been spotted and we would have been shot dead. So we booked it like we had never booked it before in our lives. And thankfully, by the time we reached the opening toward the town, which we had to run through a small field, the man who had been chasing us was now long gone. And this is presumably so that he wouldn't have been spotted. My cousin ushered us into one of his friend's homes and we proceeded to call my grandparents' house to tell them to come and pick us up. And thank God we made it back to the house in one piece. We ended up telling the authorities about it. Although looking back, that was sort of a risky move, since there are some police officers in Mexico that are in cahoots with a cartel, but we took our chance nonetheless. Fast forward a few days later, and what we ended up hearing was quite shocking. The bodies were discovered, and we found out that Los Zetas had been responsible. It turned out that the men they killed owed them money, and they didn't pay up when it was time to do so. Talk about absolutely horrifying. I mean, why would you want to get involved with a cartel? You put yourself and your family at great risk. So scary. By the way, for those wondering, this took place in the state of Coahuila. If it sounds familiar, it should. You might remember hearing about it in the news back about 10 or so years ago. That's primarily because of Los Zetas massacre that took place. Some Zeta members kidnapped families, and most were never seen again. The sad part is that some of the bodies of those kidnapped have been found dissolved in barrels. That is just one of many scary things that happened in Mexico. And in recent years, it's really gotten so bad. I really recommend that if you do plan on going to Mexico for, I don't know, let's say a vacation, stick to the resort areas. Even then, that's a bit risky. At the end of the day, it's your choice. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'll just give you what I think is the best advice to listen to. So, anyway, that is my story submission that I wanted to go ahead and share here with the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Keep up the great work, by the way, Creepy Fox. And I look forward to hearing more of your scary stories narration videos. Yesterday, we had a little get-together with my family in order to remember my dad, Ricardo. He unfortunately passed away in a very gruesome way, and in order to give you those details, we will be going back in time. By the way, I'm currently 25 years old, but this was in the mid-2000s, when Los Zetas were still around, and we were living in a small pueblo. Los Zetas were known for their brutality and torture, of rival cartel members, and sometimes even people who rub them the wrong way. Look up a channel on YouTube called Disturbed Reality if you haven't done so already. He goes over a lot of cartel gore videos, including some involving Los Zetas. But I digress. We had grown pretty poor for the most part. My mom was a stay-at-home mom who ran a small bakery business from home, and my dad struggled to maintain employment. This was why it was a shock to my mom and I, when all of a sudden, he would start to treat us to a lot of more fancier things. First it started with going out to expensive dinners, then buying nice clothes, and things like jewelry for my mom, and video game consoles for myself. However, at the same time, my dad started to disappear for long periods, and was very secretive about how he got the money. He would tell my mom and I things like, Oh, I've just been working with some friends, and they have a lot of money to pay me. One night, I was up late playing PlayStation 2, and my dad arrived home all bloodied and beat into a pulp. I got my mom, who was fast asleep, and she freaked out seeing my dad the way he was. She asked what had happened, and he said that he fell and hit his head, but that he was alright. As much as we tried, he refused to see a doctor and go to the hospital and even snapped at us when we tried calling for help. 
Fast forward a month later after that incident, and my dad recovered and once again, I was up late playing video games. I was sitting by the window with my fan on, and suddenly I started to hear the voices of men outside my house. This was followed by flashlights shining into my room, and someone calling my dad's name. I looked outside, and no joke, five armed men with AK-style rifles are threatening me to tell them where my dad was. I remember freezing in place, as they then walk out of my line of sight. Moments later, they break the front door down, and then I hear a bunch of yelling. In my young mind, my immediate thought process was self-preservation, as messed up as that sounds, and I go to hide in the closet. However, that didn't last very long when I began hearing my mom screaming. This was the kind of screaming that I can best describe as those blood-curdling screams you hear in horror movies when the villain finds the people that are hiding or is about to kill them. I open my bedroom door and start heading down the hallway. I then see my dad being dragged outside down our front porch. One of the men has a hold of my mom and I instinctively say, let go of my mom. The man holding her lets go of his grasp on her and she comes to give me a hug. It seemed that peace was upon us if not for a brief moment, as we get snapped back into reality when that man now comes over and instructs us to walk outside with him at gunpoint. We follow him out, where we see my dad on his knees being yelled at by the men. We saw some neighbors across the street staring over as well, but not getting involved in any way. Again, most likely for self-preservation. After being yelled at about stealing from the cartel and my dad crying, my dad is shot in the head, execution style. His lifeless body then fell down to the floor, as blood begins to pull on the ground. He is then shot several more times, before the men get into a nearby waiting black SUV and drive down our street, never to be seen again. And needless to say, it was an extremely traumatic event for my mom and I, and it wouldn't be until weeks later that we had found out what the motives of this shooting were. All this time, my dad had all this extra money because he had gone and worked with the Losetas cartel. The reasoning for his killing was they had found out that my dad had stolen both money and drugs from one of their many places of work, and when word got out, they came to collect by killing him as punishment. We were never visited by any cartel members after that, and as many of you who follow the drug war in Mexico, then you'll know that Los Setas no longer exists. However, with that knowledge in mind, you know that the war on drugs still continues, and many cartels still run havoc in our country. My dad's death is very unfortunate, but it's a painful reminder of just what kind of horrors we go through here in Mexico. At the end of the day, I am not trying to paint my home country with such a bad taste. With that said, I do hope that this horrific tale can educate those of you in the neighboring United States, as well as other countries, of all the things you might not have been aware of. This didn't happen directly to me, but it did happen to a cousin of mine and his girlfriend a couple of months ago. The fact that he and his girlfriend are even still alive is a shock to him. Those were his words, not mine. Now, as many of you out there know, Mexico is both a beautiful country and dangerous country at the same time. It's not to say that other countries don't have their own issues. No country is perfect, especially here in the modern era. But in Mexico, people have to live with the fear of dealing with a cartel. And not just one. There are cartels in pretty much every state of Mexico. Just to name a few, you've got the Sinaloa Cartel, Cartel del Golfo, Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, Cartel Unidos, Cartel Juarez, Los Viagras. You get the idea. Some people join cartels when they know they could make more money doing so. Others, not so much. Meaning they get forced into it or risk being killed. Although, when you live a life of crime, you're bound to be putting your life at risk anyway. I just wanted to briefly touch upon that, as unfortunately, like my cousin in this story, 
innocent civilians get stuck in the crossfire. So it was my cousin and his girlfriend and they were driving out in the countryside at approximately 2 in the morning as they were coming home from a friend's party. By the way, I'll refer to my cousin in this story as Antonio and his girlfriend as Marilena. Anyway, Antonio and Marilena stopped at a gas station to fill up on gas and inside the little convenience store, the cashier had mentioned to him how up ahead in the hills, a customer from about 30 minutes ago had mentioned that he had stumbled upon a makeshift cartel checkpoint. He said that they had extorted him for money in order to continue on his way. This, of course, is very much illegal, but it's a way for cartels to make some quick cash, as they will bribe the local law enforcement not to get involved. My cousin, being the oh-so-brave, nothing-in-the-world-scares-him mentality, just nods and says, Okay, cool, and pays for the two Coca-Cola bottles he had purchased for him and his girlfriend. Then they head back to the car. Marilena asks Antonio what the cashier had said to him, since she was in the back grabbing some snacks, and Antonio just says it was nothing, and they continue on their merry way. About 15 minutes later, heading up into the hills, which by the way they needed to do so as that road leads them to their hometown, they start to notice a bunch of headlights up ahead, and what looks to be like, you guessed it, a makeshift checkpoint. Now you see where my cousin's ignorance was catching up to him. Alongside the vehicles, they can clearly see men carrying assault rifles and other sorts of firearms. They point their guns at Antonio and Marilena and signal for them to stop. For whatever reason, Antonio suddenly freaks out and steps on the brakes and begins to start turning back. But this was a big mistake. Although looking back, Antonio tells me that he thinks they would have been in trouble if they had stopped anyway, but he can't be too sure. Antonio puts the car in reverse, and about 10 seconds later, the men in front of them getting into their vehicles. A large truck appears from behind them, from the side of the road. They had not seen this car originally because of how dark it was. Well, they bump into the side of it, and now their one exit on this single lane was blocked off. The next moments felt like an eternity, my cousin relayed to me, as the men in the truck now jump out and forcefully take Antonio and Marilena out onto the side of the road. Both have their hands up in the air, as Antonio begs the men not to harm Marilena and to please leave her alone. One of the men then takes the stock of his AK-47 and hits Antonio dead on in the stomach, which causes him to lose his breath and fall down to his knees. Marilena screams with fear as another man points his rifle at her, telling her to be quiet or they were both going to get killed. She tries to hold back tears, but is struggling to do so. Why did you two turn around? The one who had originally hit Antonio exclaims with anger. Marilena tries to speak up again, but then gets shoved to the ground and being told one last time that she was dead if she spoke another word. We aren't talking to you. We're talking to this piece of trash here. That's the nicest way of translating what they said. Antonio now regains his composure and starts telling them how sorry he was and to please leave them alone. They didn't know any better and they're just innocent civilians. Well, unfortunately for my cousin and his girlfriend, they get beat up and their phones, wallets, and car are stolen. My cousin tells me he honestly thought that him and his girlfriend were going to die. But after, again, what seemed like hours, one man yells, Yeah, basta. And they stop. Then, just as soon as they had stumbled upon these men, they all get in their vehicles, dismantle their makeshift checkpoint, and leave without saying another word to them. Now here they were, bloody and all, at the side of the road, with no way to call for help. It was about 20 minutes later, as they were walking back the way in which they came from, that a man stops and sees them, as well as their injuries. He offers to give them a ride into town in order to go to the hospital. My cousin ended up with a broken arm, and Marilena with a broken nose. They are still very shaken up by this entire incident, and are still recovering from their injuries. 
but they wanted me to share this story to you, Mr. Creepy Fox, so that it can act as a warning to your listeners. If you're going out for a drive in Mexico late in the evening, try not to do so, especially if you're going out in the middle of nowhere. These incidents happen a lot more than people even realize, and as sad as it is to say, Antonio learned that night that you can't be ignorant to what's around you. Know the warning signs, because even though anything can happen at any moment, you could avoid certain encounters if given fair enough warning. What is the first thing you think of when you hear about Mexico City? Is it the landmarks? Its high altitude? The amazing food? Or maybe you've heard about Mexico City for other reasons. Sad to say, it's reasons such as the cartel that Mexico City has recently had a spotlight in the news. You covered this on a past video where one of your subscribers who sent in their story touched up on the cartel activity there. And it's sad to say that it's pretty much all true. It's very common for people to get shot in broad daylight. And while most of the time the people involved are usually involved in some form of organized crime, you do have innocent people who are in the wrong place at the wrong time, kind of like me. I do count my lucky stars that I'm still alive, because I truly feel had things been just a bit different, well, suffice to say, you wouldn't be getting a story submission from me. So this was October of 2021 and I was in Mexico City visiting a friend of mine, who for this retelling we're going to call Guillermo. He had shown me to some of the landmarks I'd wanted to visit, and on the day before I was set to return home, I told them that I was going to go to Tepito because I'd heard they had some really amazing food vendors there. Guillermo warned me that whatever I was to do, I shouldn't even try going there, mainly because of the crime I just mentioned before. However, since ignorance is bliss, as the saying goes, and I didn't know too much about the severity. I just assumed it was like any other place in Mexico with crime. I told them I'd be fine and thus I make a trip to Tepito. It was pretty ghetto. Lots of shops sold knockoff clothes, such as knockoffs of Adidas, or even toy lines like these fake Pokemon figures. But apart from the silly little fake Pikachu toys I saw, I was instantly brought to satisfaction when I find this really kind street taco vendor. It's there I try these amazing tacos de lengua that I quickly washed down alongside my agua de jamaica and I couldn't have felt more at peace. I wasn't sure what my friend was talking about with crime since I hadn't really seen anything that he told me. I guess it helped that I wasn't dressed in anything fancy, just some pretty boring run of the mill clothing, but little was I to know that things were about to take a turn for the downright horrifying. After eating and talking with some of the locals, I asked about using the restroom and I got pointed to a building across from me that had restrooms for the general public to use. As I walk over, having to cross some light traffic of vehicles driving by, I then suddenly see as somebody with a pistol comes running in my direction. They are wearing a mask, and although I couldn't really make out their facial expressions, it looks as if they are in a panic. Moments after that, I see two other men running out from the nearby building that the first man had run out of, and both are armed with handguns as well. Now here's the crazy part. Without any sort of warning, the two armed men begin firing in my direction, the same direction that armed man number one had run to. I still don't know how to this day I wasn't hit, but regardless, People start screaming and shouting as the two men run past me, and I look back, only to see some blood trails on the ground, but the first man was out of my sight. I think it's because he was now inside the shopping area which is covered by all the shops and the tarp above. What follows next are a couple of more gunshots, and then things went silent. I just stood there, now on the other side of the road, in a state of shock and panic and I start thinking to myself, did that really just happen? Well, after what seemed like an eternity of standing there, in actuality it was only about 5 seconds, the two armed men run back out from the stores, and then go running in the complete opposite direction 
down the road. Lo mataron. Está muerto. That's what I was hearing people say. For those who don't speak Spanish, the people were basically saying, They killed him. He's dead. Yes, unfortunately, I would later learn from my friend Guillermo that on the news, they talked about a cartel member being shot in Tepito after he proceeded to steal money from one of the higher-ups. To this day, it's just so crazy to think that I have been part of that crazy afternoon. The thing is, this is almost daily. So, I guess for most people in Tepito, as well as in Mexico City, it's sad to say, but I don't really think this affects them so much. They've become desensitized to it all. It did get to me, however. And it really taught me that when you're given a warning about visiting certain places, it might be best to listen to said warnings. Though, to be fair, you can get into any sort of life-ending problems, even at home, if, say, a home burglar were to break into your house. So, yeah, all I will say to end my submission is please stay safe, everyone. This world is pretty crazy. The following story was sent in to me by a listener of mine in Guanajuato who would like to remain anonymous for privacy reasons. This ended up happening to their uncle. However, they helped their uncle write this story up, since he doesn't speak English, in order to present it in something a little more to what you're used to hearing here on the Creepy Fox. And although he's still a bit shaken up, he's doing just fine. Now here's that story. This past August of 2022, in Mexico, specifically in Guanajuato, saw one of the more violent nights in recent memory that left many people shaken in their shoes. Recently, a high-profile cartel member had been caught and arrested by authorities, and as retaliation, the CJNG, known as the Cartel Jalisco Nuevo Generación, and one of Mexico's more violent cartels, rivaling that of the Sinaloa cartel, had set ablaze to around 25 OXO stores as revenge. This also included setting up cartel roadblocks, where some cartel members would extort drivers for money, and there's even a video online where you can look up where CJNG members force a family out of their vehicle, only to then set that car ablaze. Now, I was actually at one of those OXOs when this happened, and so while not a crazy long of a story, I just figured I would tell you my side of it as an eyewitness. So I was there at the OXO because not only was I looking to get some beer for my friends and I to drink, but also since I was really needing to use the restroom really badly. And that's why, while I was in there peeing, I didn't pay too much attention to the screaming I had been hearing outside. I just told myself, must just be some rowdy teenagers messing around. It happens. Whatever, we've all been there. However, the yells get even more audible, and as I'm about to put my hand on the door handle so I can grab the beers and then leave, I heard a bunch of curse words. This was then followed by loud pops, which obviously turned out to be gunshots. Well, just like in the news reports you might have heard of, and maybe the videos you saw, I was left shocked as armed CJNG cartel members tell everybody to get out, as just as soon as they had arrived, a fire begins to ensue. It's kind of crazy to think about it, because I still remember how one of the bullets had flown past me, since I even heard the sound of it breaking the sound barrier by my ears, and then hitting a post beside me. When I got out of the store, and I began running across the street, with other people just there watching with their phones, it's now I got the full picture, as well as the severity on what's unfolding. Here was this OXO that I had just been in about a minute ago, now completely set ablaze, with all the front windows shattered from the bullets, with the CJNG now getting into the vehicle that they had arrived in and driving away, almost as if this was something of a routine that they were used to. I myself was pretty terrified to be perfectly honest, and now even as I write this out, I'm still a bit shaken up, but I share this in hopes to have my side of the story heard by a larger audience. What we deal with here is absolutely no joke, and I hope that none of you listening ever have to experience this firsthand, because it's not something you want to be a part of. It just sucks, since I had no choice. It was basically wrong place at the wrong time.
Every year you hear stories about stolen identity and how people are always trying to fend off scammers with things such as phishing attempts that seem to be getting more sophisticated with each passing day. Well, okay. Does mistaken identity count as well? I guess it kind of does since it can still get you into quite some trouble, like what happened to my cousin Maria's boyfriend. Now, he's doing so much better now, thank god. Since for a time there when this had initially happened, we thought things were going to go into a different direction, but regardless, I want to tell you about what exactly happened to him. Most of this story is from the perspective of my cousin Maria, who only speaks Spanish. However, we worked together over a phone call since I told her about your Creepy Fox channel and her and her boyfriend would love it if you could use this story to hopefully raise some awareness on the crimes that happen in Mexico because of the cartel. Of course, Maria isn't actually her real name and I'll give a made up name for her boyfriend as well. We will call him Rogelio. Rogelio and Maria, up to today, have been together for six years and as they spend most of their time together, it's no wonder why our family call them the real life Romeo and Juliet. On the night of this incident, both of them had just left a friend's house after celebrating that friend's birthday and now they're making their walk back home to Maria's house, which was about 15 minutes away. It was roughly 10.45pm and the streets are pretty quiet considering it was a Sunday evening and most people were getting ready to head to work on the following morning. As they're enjoying their peaceful night, minding their own business, and talking about what they wanted to do on their next date, they noticed a black unmarked van drive by them very slowly. It was a bit strange. Maria had brought it up with Rogelio, since it looked as if they were being followed. But after the van had driven away, they thought perhaps it was just some creeper looking at her, but then drove away when they saw the expression on Rogelio's face. Well, this was the least of their worries, because a minute later when they're turning the corner of the street, they had run in to an ambush. That same van, but now one of them had gotten out of the van and he's brandishing a gun. Now, I know this next part might be a bit too graphic for some of you listening, so please stop listening if this might disturb you. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, so basically, without question, the armed man, who has got his face covered by the way, says the following in Spanish, which my cousin to this day still remembers very clearly. This is what you get when fools like you are involved with those Sinaloa guys. Viva El Mencho. If you don't know who El Mencho is, which I would be pretty surprised if you didn't know who he is, basically he's the head honcho of the Jalisco cartel. And yeah, his cartel and Sinaloa don't exactly get along. They hate it when their rival cartel members intrude on their business and their territory. But here's the thing, Rogelio wasn't even involved with a cartel. Well, anyway, the gunman fires a single gunshot, which strikes Ricardo in the lower abdomen, before Maria yells for them to stop. Luckily, he doesn't fire another shot, but what happens next is the gunman gets closer to them and then says, Wait, this isn't our guy. We got the wrong guy. Mistaken identity, like I talked about in the intro. These armed cartel members have shot Rogelio by mistake, and now he's losing blood, fast. Well, they didn't stick around to help with first aid. They just drove out of there as Maria starts to panic and scream. Thank God that there were some good Samaritans in a nearby house that had seen what had happened and they quickly come over to help with first aid. One of them turned out to be a registered nurse. She helped Rogelio with the bleeding until paramedics arrived to take Rogelio to the ER. It was scary for a while, but Rogelio did make a recovery and he still lives with the scar in his stomach to show what he had gone through that night. How they had gotten the wrong guy and mistaken him for someone else? Your guess is as good as mine, but since that evening, they both never go walking alone after dark, which I can't really blame them, to be perfectly honest. When you're a kid, being taught stranger danger is one of the most important and valuable sets of information your brain will ever store in your life. Sometimes, however, 
you might have a slip up or two, and this was one of my lacks of judgment that saw myself and my cousin encountering one of the most horrifying experiences of our lives. I don't really think I've heard anybody ever have this happen to them, but let me know if you have. For context, this was back in 2008, when I was on spring break visiting family in the state of Michoacan. If that name sounds familiar, it should. Michoacan, a beautiful state in Mexico with its fauna and flora, has been overrun by violence in recent years. It's quite sad to be honest, but at the time I was visiting, that was really unheard of. Anyway, I should mention I'm male and I was 15 years old when this happened. Now it all started when my cousin, Carlos, aged 17, and myself, ended up going to the beach so that we could ride on our ATVs as well as go fishing. The stretch of beach that we drove on went on for miles. It took about an hour and a half just to arrive at the little peninsula at the end. That's where we were aiming to go. Only reason we were going that far was because another family member had been out there years ago and they claimed that that's where all the big and rare fish were located at. Anyway, before we even started anything, we stopped at a little store so we could pick up some bait as well as some snacks for the drive along the way. I recall the man at the cash register warning us about driving too far as they had recently dealt with a couple of ATV riders being stuck out in the middle of nowhere. The only reason they were found was because somebody in a boat that had been fishing by the coast actually managed to see them. So we thanked them for the knowledge as we exit the little shop and we prepare for the long trek ahead of us. Before we knew it, the once busy and lively beach with families and kids playing in the water was silenced by the sounds of our engines as we are on our ATVs heading east along the coast with our sun-kissed skin being met with the warm silky summer's air. Along the way we saw plenty of birds flying above us with plenty of patches of coconut trees being littered every few miles. After approximately an hour and a half, we noticed what looked to be like a series of abandoned huts. Seeing as both of us are very curious, we let go of the gas and soon hit the brakes, as our ATVs eventually come to a stop. You guessed it, we wanted to check out the huts. Because, you know, curiosity. The huts were fairly boring apart from the vulgar graffiti and trash that was scattered everywhere. We had to be careful as there were a bunch of broken bottles and even a couple of used syringes. Come to think of it, we were pretty dumb to even attempt walking in those small structures. Anyway, while we were reading some of the graffiti, we ended up being interrupted by the sound of a car engine approaching. This spooked both of us as we used the cover of the structure to take a look outside. Moments later, a truck with five men step out, each with guns, and we're not talking about little pistols. Oh no, I'm talking full-on assault rifles. You should have seen the look of absolute fear on our faces as we hear one of them make a remark about our ATVs. From the looks of it, it appeared that they were part of the cartel, as if things couldn't get any worse. They now begin searching the immediate area. We used the cover of a cheap couch to hide, but we ended up being found anyway. I'm surprised the man just didn't end us right there and then and shoot us dead. But he told us to stand up and put our hands up and then slowly walk out of the hut. We were met, moments later, with a sudden stare of eyes from the intimidating men. The entire time their assault rifles didn't leave our small and non-threatening teenage frames. One of them now asks us what we were doing here to which we nervously respond with just saying we were taking a break. They then talk amongst themselves before returning their attention back to us, saying that no ordinary teenagers have any business being in here. They go on to explain that this was a location where they did their so-called drug trade and nobody was allowed to be loitering around unless they had some sort of connection with their cartel group. We apologize non-stop thinking at any moment this was going to be it. I still count my lucky stars for who would appear to be the leader telling us to never return again, or next time 
His men weren't going to be so generous. I still think, since we looked really young for our age, they must have felt really bad. They lower the assault rifles, as both Carlos and I jump back on our ATVs, and we leave. That wasn't without one final warning. They ended up firing a couple of rounds into the air, which I think was their way of saying, you got off lucky. So unfortunately, or should I say, fortunately, we didn't go to that fishing spot we were told of, and instead we drove back home, never to return to that beach again. As an update, all of these years later, it's advised people stay away from that area. It's very dangerous. Not that you have to convince me otherwise. This was March 2022, and my friends and I, a group of four, had gone to Nayarit to spend a few days relaxing at one of the resorts for my friend Ricardo's 30th birthday. Things went pretty smoothly, as I finally got a break from working so much with my dad. By the time we're driving back home to Manzanillo, I'm feeling well rested. At one point in the drive, as we're on the mountainside heading back home, my friend Ricardo takes over the wheel and tells me that there was this really cool bridge area that he wanted to show us, which he had driven past before when coming out to this area that we were currently in. He told us that it was haunted, and that even in the daytime it was possible to see a woman similar to that of La Llorona. My friends and I called BS on that, but we decided what the heck, let's go and check it out either way. In order to get there, you did have to do a little bit of off-roading from the main road that cars are driving on, but once we found the unmarked dirt road in question, we begin driving for about six to seven minutes, arriving at the bridge my friend had mentioned. I remember Ricardo making a bunch of jokes at this point, telling us the woman was staring at us from behind some trees, as he did his best to try and scare us. Anyway, we now got out of the car and we start to approach the bridge, which is filled with a bunch of graffiti and trash, oh, lots of beer bottles and the like. After about two minutes of just messing around and trying to scare one another, we ended up looking over to our right, and we can see a black SUV off-roading and heading in our direction. It was definitely a bit strange seeing it out there, and it wasn't until they got closer and the doors opened that we realized the grave mistake that we had made. We weren't aware of it at the time, and neither was Ricardo since the last time he had been there about two years ago, there was nothing wrong. But apparently, this area we had driven into was now off limits to normal citizens. Out of that SUV that had all its windows tinted were three armed CJNG cartel members, each holding onto their own assault rifles. We knew it was CJNG because their body armor had the logo on it. At that moment, I remember my body going cold and a chill going down my spine as the weapons are now pointed at my friends and I and time seems to go into slow motion. It's like suddenly all my life flashed before me and I could see my mom and dad as well as my younger sister during a time when my mom was still alive. I was suddenly however brought back to reality when one of the men asks us what we were doing out here, and that we had no business exploring the area. We start apologizing and telling him that we had no idea as we had not seen any sort of private property signs, nor no trespassing signs. One of the CJNG members tells the others what they should do with us, and he mentions that we should be shot and killed right there and then, in order to teach others why you shouldn't be driving in areas that are off limits. How I didn't just die of a heart attack hearing that, I don't know. But the crazy thing was, it seems that they get a change of heart, because he scoffs off his remark, and then tells us, You're not allowed here. We're going to let you go. But if we ever see you here again, we will have no problem shooting you dead. Am I understood? Each of us, these grown men on the verge of tears, start thanking them profusely, as we immediately get back into the car and drive back the way we had come from. That was essentially all there was to it. It's sad to say that these are common occurrences in Mexico, where people will stumble upon the CJNG or other cartels in Mexico, but on those other occasions, the citizens sometimes don't end up so lucky. 
they end up either tortured or murdered and their bodies are put on display in the town square for others to see. It does happen, believe it or not, and you can look it up yourself if you don't believe me. Anyway, thus brings a close to my submission. Thank you Creepy Fox for allowing me to share this experience with my fellow Creepy Fox listeners. I hope that this story of mine, for how terrifying it truly is, can open people's eyes on just some of the scary things that happen over here in Mexico, which unfortunately doesn't really seem to get any sort of news coverage in the United States, which is sad if I do say so myself, as lots of us innocent people have to suffer in silence as nothing is done. I was traveling with my family in the state of Guanajuato and we had stopped by a gas station to fill up on fuel. There is also an OXO attached to this gas station. OXO was kind of similar to 7-Eleven in the United States, if you want to make that comparison. Anyway, this occurred over the summer of 2022. It's around 8pm at night and the streets are relatively calm as my cousins and I enter the little shop to grab some snacks and use the restroom. I ended up being the first to get out of the building out of all the younger kids since they take forever deciding on what snacks they want. I went over to our large van to wait with my dad and my uncle as my aunt and the kids are inside the gas station. However, all of a sudden I remember this truck with a bunch of armed CJNG cartel members driving up to the gas station and then they start running in our direction. They begin shouting at everyone to get out and saying El Mencho's name as moments after that, my cousins and my aunt are screaming and running out of the store. Some gunshots were heard being fired from inside the store, and then about 15 seconds later, we begin to see a small fire begin to ensue. One of the cartel members did run up to me, my dad and my uncle, and told us not to say anything or there was going to be trouble, which we all just stood there and nodded our heads. The cartel member then stormed off with the rest of the men who get into the same truck and left. In total, this all happened in about a minute. That was pretty much all that happened to us, but what makes this so much scarier was what we would learn later in the news. In fact, one of the reasons I wanted to share my own scary experience was because of a video the Creepy Fox released last year, the second volume of the Cartel Stories video he did. Another listener sent in a similar story of him being at an OXO when CJNG cartel members ran in and set the place ablaze. What a small world we live in for another Creepy Fox listener to have experienced a similar thing. Anyway, just like what that subscriber described, basically what happened was there were some higher ups in the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion, shortened as CJNG, who got arrested. And as revenge, the CJNG members went around lighting gas stations and OXOs on fire. It is scary when you really think about it. Mexico, especially in today's environment and modern age, is experiencing a huge increase of violence with the cartel. I constantly hear about how bad things get in the United States, and it's not to undermine any of it all. That's not my point here. But to go to Mexico, you're going to be in for quite a disturbing reality. None of this really gets talked about, and it's my hopes that stories like mine can hopefully shed some light on the reality of the horrors that we constantly have to deal with. The cartel basically run the country as they're in cahoots with the government and they bribe a lot of police officers to turn a blind eye. Meanwhile, the cartel are free to commit all the crimes they want and sadly, a lot of times, innocent bystanders get caught up on accident and they get killed. I do highly recommend that if you're going to visit Mexico, do it responsibly. Have someone with you who knows the area you'll be visiting. It's not that cartel members target people visiting the country on purpose, but if you're clueless to where you're going, you might get yourself into an area where you're more likely to get hurt, or even worse, kidnapped. I found your Creepy Fox YouTube channel on the video recommendations of Disturbed Reality's Funky Town Gore Upload, and I see you've covered people's scary encounters with the cartel. I have something that happened to me that was very horrifying relating to the cartel, and it's pretty graphic, 
so I do have to give your listeners a bit of an advisory before I begin. For privacy reasons, all names have been changed. With that said, the last summer, 2022, I went to visit family in Mexico and Sinaloa for summer vacation. It was just myself, since my parents were really busy with work. One evening after dinner, my cousins, who we will call Marcos, Antonio, and Jessica, and myself, took a small road trip approximately 45 minutes out of the city limits to head to this lake we often frequented when we were younger. It's really off in the middle of nowhere and you do have to do a bit of off-roading to get to said lake, but the view it offered was gorgeous. We pulled up to the lake right around sunset and with the back of my cousin's truck open, we took out some drinks and just chilled listening to the music on the radio. I would say about 20 minutes in, having laughs and talking about the past, I had to take a really bad leak. So I decided I was going to walk over to a tree closer to the lake to relieve myself. As I got closer to the lake, this bad stench entered my nostrils and almost made me throw up. Now we had gotten a bit of a whiff where we were parked, but we assumed it came from the lake, thus we thought no big deal. I could now see and hear the sound of flies, and when I peeked the corner of the tree, I saw something that to this day is engraved in my memory. This is your final warning for those of you who might be a bit squeamish to gory details. This is where I highly recommend you turn down the volume. Okay, so are you ready? Well, I found a body completely dismembered with guts spilled out and the head was nowhere to be found. This is the point where I actually threw up and I instantly screamed over to my cousins in absolute panic. Guys, there's a body here. We need to go, now. They thought I was pulling a prank on them, and what do you know, morbid curiosity has them walking over to see what I had just found. My cousin Jessica fainted at that moment, but we caught her before she could fall into the dirt below. When she came to, we walked her back to the truck, and we decided we needed to leave, and leave now. We packed up her stuff, and we leave. Fast forward about a week later, we were in the living room watching the news and there was a story about how various dismembered bodies had been found in that same area, the same lake that we had been hanging out at. And what do you know, it turned out that those responsible were the Sinaloa cartel. Well, what do you know, we all looked at each other and we genuinely almost broke out in tears. We thought, what if we stumbled into the Sinaloa cartel while we were out there? We had no idea about that lake being cartel territory, let alone where they had been dumping bodies. All those what ifs, even today, keep me up at night. Also, who was that poor soul I found that evening, and who were the others? They never did say in the news report, and while I have no plans to visit Mexico anytime soon, I feel for my family and those who do live in Mexico. Just the amount of violence they see in their daily lives and on the news is crazy. The cartels in Mexico are no joke, and I really agree with the statement one of your subscribers stated in a previous Cartel Stories video of yours. Almost none of this gets talked about here in the United States, and it's sad because a lot of the overdoses that take place here usually come from drugs that are supplied by the cartel in Mexico. Obviously, I talk about things such as fentanyl overdoses. It sucks because there's almost nothing that's done by the Mexican government. They won't do much to stop the cartel problem. It's probably because they get bribed to turn a blind eye. Anyway, that is my scary story for all of you today. If you are planning on visiting Mexico anytime soon, Please make sure to do your research, and please, make sure to stay safe. When I was 12 years old, I lived a life not many live. I lived in Mexico in a very small town of no more than 200 people, where everyone knew each other. This is early 2012, and one main road to go to different towns. I listen to this genre of music that portrays this lifestyle of drugs, money, guns, and all that stuff. Basically, a narco. 
So there I was, 12 years old, drinking cheap beer, smoking weed and cigarettes and making stupid decisions. It didn't help that my dad and grandpa were independent narcos. They didn't work for a cartel in particular, but they sold illegal substances here in the United States, making lots of money, but that was back then. Of course there were cartels and chaos, but not in our area. Everything was happening very far away from us, but suddenly the cartel divided into two, and they started killing each other, so land was what they were fighting for. Suddenly there are all these rules. No loud music, no hanging out in the town park, no cars after 10 p.m., etc. Basically, all these rules. So my friends and I slowed down, but we still did our stupid things, since I was the one with the money. They would hang out a lot with me and rode with me in my quad or my truck. One night, we were on my quad with two friends. I'll refer to them as P and J. We were leaving after some drinking in another town, about five minutes from my town, and this is when we noticed a white Nissan Tacoma with the passenger side messed up because it was hit. It was very rare to see it as it rarely passed by. As I said, there was only one main road to move from city to city, and you had to pass by these two towns. We were in front of the truck, and I took a left to the last street of the main road, because after that last street, it was the main road. It's then a five minute ride to my town, and of course I wasn't going to come even close to this truck. I stopped at the end of the block, and we were already spooked talking about it, but in a joking way. We then saw it passing by, but... Suddenly it stopped and turned down the volume. They were playing corrido, and at the same time I turned off my quad and immediately told my friends to get off to make it seem like we just parked. We said amongst ourselves, we were going to go to the store or something like that. I was looking directly at them. I couldn't see their face, but I could clearly see the guys on the bed where their AK-47s. They started moving again, and we almost lost sight of them when they suddenly started reversing. We ran back to the quad and sped off, and of course they started following us. The fear that I felt was unbearable. It scares people just to see them pass by. Dozens of trucks with four to eight guys on the beds with high caliber rifles. I seriously thought I was going to die. All I could do is push my thumb to the limit, turn my lights off, and hide somewhere in town. Not only was I lucky that I had a quad on tough terrain, but since it was loose dirt and rocks, a lot of dust rose up, making it hard for the cartel members to drive, but that was not the end. I could barely open my own eyes. I felt the dust on my teeth, eyelashes white, dust everywhere, panicking with my friends. I thought I just placed the death sentences of me and my entire family. This was no joke. All we could do is sit and think. We didn't even speak. The worst thing is we could hear the engine roaring and the corrido all over town looking for us in the silent night. That damn song that I'll never forget. We sat there for what felt like all night, but it was probably about 30 minutes. I couldn't even call anyone as we were sitting in the middle of the forest with no signal whatsoever. We already knew that we were dead. I mean, nobody escapes the cartel, especially in this area. So I get messed up and called my girlfriend, telling her my goodbyes, and I know what you might be thinking. No 12 year old would do, slash, think things like this. However, like I said, thanks to the music and lifestyle of my town, I feel that a 12 year old has the mindset of a 20 year old. Continuing with my story. I drop my friends off at their houses and then go to sleep. Next day I wake up, cloudy fresh day, mom baking and P and another friend have long sad faces. He already knew and told me, what's up viejon? P already told me about it. So what the hell are you going to do? I wasn't sure. I was sad, hungover, depressed, tired, angry. I was an emotional disaster. I mean, what would you do knowing that a power greater than the government was following you and looking for you in two very small towns, which are five minutes apart? 
I knew I couldn't hide. I knew they would recognize the quad. Basically, I knew I was a dead kid walking. There was a family of punteros in my town. Punteros, pointers, work for the cartel and let them know when the feds pass by. One of my friend's family were punteros, but he wasn't with me the night that the pursuit happened and he didn't even know because he didn't use the radios. Only his dad and some of his brothers. He'll go by. G. Two days pass by. J and G come to my home and drive to the other town to hang out and we see G's brother approaching us. He was a puntero. Yo, I have something to tell you. Sunday, I heard the Templars talking about some quad doing stupid shit. Were you those guys? Of course, J and I freeze. I immediately feel the awkwardness, the fear. I can't even speak at all. He says, Listen, it doesn't matter. The point is you guys are very lucky. I told them that I knew you guys and that you were cool and that it wouldn't happen again. So don't do stupid stuff like that again or you'll get both of us killed. Months pass by and because you don't mess with a cartel, I did slow down. I took this very personally as I had another chance at life because G's brother made it very clear what would happen if I ever dared to disrespect the cartel like that again. I kept doing less of the same. Now this doesn't end here unfortunately, but this wasn't the last time I encountered these guys, nor are they the only ones. I may update this if some of you really want to keep reading. Update number one. This one time, I was with J and P again but there were also another two dudes on their own quads from the city. Both of their quads were way faster than mine, and mine wasn't even in stable condition to begin with, as one of the lights didn't work, and the reverse didn't work either. We were already drunk, and we were bored, so one of the guys was like, Hey, let's go to my dad's farm. Some Templars are hiding there. They know me, and they're cool with us. Perhaps we could get a chance to unload one of their weapons and drink with them and so we go. As I've said, there's only one main road with no pavement, and so we went not to the other town in the south, but we went back north, where the road went to the city that is about 30 minutes away. The entire road is surrounded by farms, which mostly consist of lemons, and just forest on the other right side of the road, and there's a small river there too. We rode for about 10 minutes, and we got close, but before we went there, we stopped and the guy who knew these guys tells us, All right, let me go first since they know me. They'll most likely get spooked, but they'll see it's me. And we turn right and cross the small bridge over the river and enter a small road that went to the farm. The terrain was rough, all muddy and wet and gross in the pitch dark night with no sound, just the engine slowly driving. Suddenly, a bunch of lights turn on and they start blinding us. You know those small but powerful blue lights? Those lights. But we can't make out anything. Now of course the other guy on his quad, the one I haven't mentioned yet, gets spooked, puts it in reverse, and goes. But as he's doing that, we hear gunshots. I don't know if they were fired at us or just warning shots, but it was scary as all hell. I was in the middle and so I tried to reverse, but it wouldn't work and me and P get out to push it, and just as we are. The guy who knew these people rams my quad, attempting to leave, and so we end up falling. While P and I move the quad, J sits to drive, and we just hop on and start driving. At this point, I was very scared and didn't know if I had just been shot or what, but thankfully, they didn't follow us, otherwise they would have easily caught up, and we never even saw the other two quads because they were going so much faster. Nothing ever happened to me or J and P, but unfortunately, one of the guys had to drive the same road back to get to his place, and he encountered some Templars. Don't know if they were the same we encountered or others, but that day, I lost a friend who was never found, not even his quad. Nothing ever happened to the guy who knew them, and I don't blame him for it or myself. It's just that stuff like this always happened. This took place when I was vacationing in the state of Sinaloa in late 2017 
with a couple of my best friends. We stayed at a resort right by the beach and our plan was to soak in the sun, eat as much food as we possibly could and maybe hook up with some of the ladies. Because being the immature college students we were, we weren't exactly the smartest bunch. However, even with that said, we had known about the dangers of leaving the resort area and we knew by being told by the hotel staff and some of the locals to avoid certain streets if we did plan on being out late. It's not only the fact that we have to look out for your typical petty criminals, but for those who don't know, a lot of the resorts you find in Mexico, well, they have businesses near said resorts that are owned by the cartel. For example, in Cancun, it's said that there are some nightclubs and even some bars that they own that generate extra revenue for them. Because, you know, apparently selling drugs, guns, and people isn't exactly enough for them. But anyway, it was a couple of days before we were set to return back to the United States and we decided on going to a restaurant that's a bit further of a walk from the resort area that we had been staying at. This was recommended by a local that we had met on the beach. Again, we were told to avoid going down a certain street, but on the way back from the dinner, we ended up going down the wrong road by a mistake. We would be aware of this critical error because we suddenly saw a vehicle approach us from in front when we started sneaking around a nearby building. It piqued our interest because of how suspicious it looked and because we're curious cats. Anyway, it was a black SUV and all the windows are tinted up. My friends and I try to continue past them, finding it a bit eerie, but ignoring it. But then they pulled up beside us. We looked over and in the driver's seat is a man who is pointing a gun right in our face. We can also make out another individual in the passenger seat. We got really scared in that moment, as in broken English, the man asks us what we were doing there and that we weren't welcome. Now you'd think this would be the moment in which we would run, but stupid us remained there frozen. Enough time to notice that another vehicle pulled up behind us. They ended up jumping out of the vehicle, two of them, similar to the first, and both of them are armed with M4 assault rifles. They're also wearing body armor too. They begin harassing us and asking us what we're doing on this street and we tell them that we're just trying to get back to the hotel and that we aren't looking to cause any sort of problems. There is some more back and forth as we're held at gunpoint for the next couple of minutes. But basically the first guy who was on a radio looks over at us and says, Leave and don't go around walking in areas you shouldn't be in. They would proceed to tell us which way to go back and we basically noped out of there, finally seeing the familiar street that we had been on before. So that was the time that my friends and I stumbled into Sinaloa cartel members after we determined was them keeping some sort of secret in that building. I mean, what are the chances that of all places and times there happen to be cartel members just going out for a casual evening drive. I did say cartel do businesses near resorts, so maybe that's what was going on in that building and we got a little bit too close for their comfort. Either way, I have never been back to Mexico since. I just got back from a family vacation in Los Cabos, Mexico. We stayed at a nice western resort and usually around 9.30 p.m., my family would head back to their rooms to go to sleep. Naturally, as a 25-year-old, I wanted to stay up and party or go drinking at the bars, but my older brother was working remotely and wouldn't go out with me. After the family went to bed, I went out to a bar around the corner from my hotel and ended up befriending the locals there and a 29-year-old guy from San Diego named Luke. Who was there for a wedding. We started hanging out every night after my family went to sleep and on the third night of the trip, Luke asked if I wanted to meet him in downtown Los Cabos with his friends. I really wanted to, but I was at an important dinner with a family that went on later than usual. I ended up staying home that night. The next night I met him at this huge, 
Pablo Escobar-esque mansion that they rented on Airbnb, and he told me that it was good I couldn't make it out the night before because of how scary of an experience it was. He explained to me that the night before, his buddy was taking a piss outside, and someone approached him and held out a key with a bump of coke on it, without thinking. He snorted the bump, and the person who offered it was now demanding he buy an $80 bag from them. He was drunk and downright refused, while getting pretty aggressive towards them. Things then went from bad to worse, as the man who offered the bump started following their group from bar to bar for the next three hours, taking pictures of them. He called his friends, and there were now a group of them following behind them and claiming to be affiliated with a cartel. They warned that if Luke's buddy didn't pay them, they were going to call their boss. Luke eventually went over and tried to smooth things over. They told him his friend had stolen from them. It was going to cost him his life if someone didn't pay up. The cartel member also pulled up his shirt, revealing a 9mm pistol in his waistband. Luke did the right thing and remained calm while offering to take them to an ATM machine and a payout a pocket of 160 US dollars so they could all be left alone. The cartel members gave him an empty coke bag and abruptly left. Even after him doing all this for his friend's safety, his friend denied any responsibility or wrongdoing and even had the audacity to blame Luke for trying to help by getting involved. He also didn't offer Luke a single dollar. After that event happened, Luke got robbed again in the same night with a girl who ripped his $200 gold necklace right off his neck. His friend was cool to me but sounded like a real asshole after Luke explained this to me. Poor dude was just trying to be a good friend and was met with no gratitude, only to be robbed again. Needless to say, I am very happy I didn't make it out to meet them that night. I also think things could have gotten a lot worse for them had he not offered the cartel members money. Be careful out there and never accept free drugs from a stranger on the street in Mexico or really anywhere. It always comes with a price. This evening in question that I'm riding into the Creepy Fox for a future narration is hands down the most terrifying event of my life. I've never shared this with any other narrator, just Mr. Creepy Fox. And through it all I've learned that you can never take a life for granted. One moment, things are peaceful and you're relaxed having a good time with your family. And the next thing you know, you're fighting for your survival. And you're trying to make sure you can make it back home in one piece. With that little bit stated, let me go ahead and bring you all back with me as we rewind to the year 2017. It's spring break season, and myself and my parents are in Mexico visiting family in the small town of Tecoman. Some of you who have been long-time listeners of the Creepy Fox have probably heard a couple of stories from that town. I know just recently I listened to his scary fishing trip stories video, and there was a story in that video that took place just outside of the town of Tecoman. Such a small world. If you do enough research yourself, you'll see that it's kind of a dangerous town today, filled with lots of drug trade and shootouts between rival cartel members. I'm actually quite surprised I don't see many people talking about this. It's a major issue here in Mexico. Actually, in the neighboring city of Colima, there are nightly shootouts between rival cartels. There's plenty of videos online as well as including the gruesome aftermath. A shame as people can't really go out like they once did in fear they're going to get caught in the crossfire. But back to Tecoman. Things never used to be that way. Late 2017 was really when the violence started to become more noticeable and apart from just little petty crimes, when I went to visit my family, there wasn't really anything we worried of. By the way, for context, I was 19 years old and my younger cousins were 14 and 15 respectively. During my week stay, I played soccer with my younger cousins on the neighborhood streets, swam in the pool, and at night we would stay up in the backyard listening to music and having amazing cookouts. Innocence and fun. That's until the evening of St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, specifically that night in question. After all, it's not every day you have something like this happen to you, 
so you'll remember that exact day and time. And no, before you ask, it's not really as major of a holiday in Mexico as it is in other countries. At any rate, it was about 9.15, 9.20pm and it's myself and my two cousins, Cristina and Jorge. We were in the center of the city, sitting on a bench having some raspados and listening to a local mariachi band that was playing on a stage, where nearby there are plenty of people singing along and dancing. There were some little pop-up stands where the townsfolk were selling treats and handmade jewelry and clothing. We sat there at the bench for about 10 minutes, just minding our own business, when I got a call from my mother. She was with my Aunt Lupe, mother of Cristina and Jorge, and they had just gotten out of the grocery store on the other side of town. They advised us they would be here in about 15 minutes, and to go ahead and meet them where they had dropped us off originally, at the ice cream shop that we got the raspados. Before we got the chance to get up, however, we are suddenly interrupted by the sounds of loud pops in the distance. There were just two at first, and we thought maybe it was just some kids lighting some firecrackers. However, a few more shots are heard ringing out less than 10 seconds later, and it's at this moment it's becoming more apparent that what we're hearing is gunfire, not fireworks. The mariachi band stops playing, and suddenly you start seeing people diving for cover and running into the nearby businesses. While it might have been smartest to have just hid under the bench, we felt as if we were sitting ducks if we waited here. We too decided to risk it all, and we run toward a nearby zapateria, where we immediately take cover behind some of the aisles of shoes. The gunfire lasts for about 20 seconds, and finally after what seemed like an eternity, but was only maybe two minutes, we peek out from cover, and people are starting to walk outside. We are able to see the once vibrant and filled town square is completely empty. Well, wouldn't you know that what took place was that there was a fight between rival cartel members who happened to have been in the area that actually got recognized. That's when the shootout took place. If you can believe it, no civilian was injured by some miracle of God, but two of the cartel members were gunned down. My mother and aunt eventually did arrive to pick us up and as you probably imagined it, they were pretty horrified, thinking something terrible had happened to us. Nothing else, however, happened the next couple of days there in Mexico, and we did return back home safely to Texas. A few weeks later, I was catching up with Christina, and she told me there was a retaliation between the rival cartels, but it took place outside of the city limits. Apparently, it was pretty bloody. Since then, my aunt uncle and cousins have moved out of Tecoman to an even more quiet and secluded town by the ocean side. She tells me that for now it's safe, but even so they never go out at night and they're always staying vigilant of their surroundings. Hey there fox man, how are you doing? I've been meaning to write in my story and I finally got in around to doing so. I hope to make it in before the end of the year. This is pretty short, but nonetheless it's a scary experience that I had back in 2017 that had me fearing very much for both mine and my family's life. For context, this is from the perspective of a 38 year old male. I was taking my wife, my two kids, a daughter and son, on a road trip vacation to visit the city of Guanajuato, located in this state also called Guanajuato. If you like to see how this city looks, I forget which videos they were exactly, but they're definitely from November and December of 2019, but the creepy fox has some episodes where he went there and actually filmed some background footage. You'll have to put it in a pinned comment or something, because you gotta check it out for yourself. Anyways, we are originally from the neighboring state, Michoacan driving from La Ciudad Hidalgo, and we were pretty much in the middle of nowhere in the countryside, when up ahead of us, we saw various dark unmarked SUVs and vans begin to block the road. I was confused, considering there were no indications of traffic stops or signage that said we would need to come to a halt. There are tolls you need to pay every once in a while when driving in Mexico, but these are always ginormous rest areas with state employees that have you stopping. Nothing of the sort here. 
Well, as not crashed directly into them, we come to a stop, and we awaited these people's next move. It was only maybe 10 seconds, but it felt like an eternity, before all of a sudden, men armed with assault rifles and wearing coverage over their faces appeared out of the vehicles and now began to approach us. As a quick note here, nothing indicated there were police, which began to raise alarms in my head. What other armed individuals can you think of in Mexico? I'll give you a second. Guessed it? Yep, the cartel. I'll translate everything said next in the following sentences so I don't have to keep jumping back and forth between English and Spanish, since I don't want to annoy you. What happened next was basically four out of a total of about 12 men surrounded our vehicle and then told us to roll down the driver's window. What other choice did we have since they were pointing the rifles towards us? I nervously pressed the window button down and I now get asked by the man next to me where I was going and what were our plans. I struggle to get words out as I tell the man I'm with my wife and kids and I'm taking them on a little vacation and we're just trying to pass by. The guy now looks at his men for a few seconds before returning his attention back to me and toward the back seat. What lovely kids you have. They look just like you. They're both seven and eight respectively, and in their childhood minds, they honestly didn't think much of these armed men, what it's like to have such innocence. I begged the armed man that we aren't trying to cause any trouble and we just want to get to our destination, and thankfully after some short tense moments, he says, I'll tell you what, you all caught us on a good day, we'll let you pass. I wasn't sure what that meant. But just like that, this stranger tells the men to move the vehicles, and with that, we are allowed to go. Have a good time, the man says, before I waste not even another moment to drive out of there, my wife basically in tears with how scared she was. It wasn't until another 45 minutes later that we did eventually reach a tolling area, and we told one of the officers there about what happened. As expected, None of their agents were out there, nor did he say would they ever point their weapons at unarmed citizens. When I mentioned that we might have encountered the cartel, he basically confirms my thoughts and details of the group, saying further that we were lucky to have gotten out of there in one piece. It is really sad because there are actually stories and encounters of this happening to people here in Mexico, where they'll get stopped by the cartel. But a lot of times, those experiences don't end well. The unfortunate citizen, or citizens, will end up as another statistic in the newspaper, being lost to organized crime. Do I count myself lucky? Absolutely. Do I think they had bad intentions? Of course. Was it possible seeing my children, they changed their plans? It is something my wife and I can agree on. Whatever the case may be, we're just very happy to be very much alive, and I'm glad that even though it is now just a story of mine, I can share it to hopefully raise awareness with just how dangerous it can be driving in the Mexican countryside. To this very day, I have no idea as to what we could have done to have deserved this. These situations are just occurrences that, for whatever reason, leave you in this absolute state of shock, fear really, that ultimately leave you in a loss of words. As the years have come and gone, I often return to this experience to remind my friends just how in one very moment, everything can end just like that. A reminder of why it's important to never take things for granted. This is the first time I'm sharing this online to anyone, and through the voice of the creepy fox, I tell you my experience. I remember this very well. 2005, Thanksgiving evening. I was just 17 years old at the time, and myself alongside my mom and my dad were visiting my grandparents for Thanksgiving in southern Texas, who lived near the border. That night I recall having this overall sense of joy and happiness as this yearly tradition was something I always looked forward to. 
My grandma always made the best stuffing and potato salad that I made an effort to not to eat throughout the year. This way, when the day arrived, it made it that much more special. That afternoon, we spent catching up on life, talking about how I was getting ready to head to college for the next year, and even the part-time job I had picked up working for a family friend. It must have been hours of talking and good times before I realized it was time for us to go back home, a roughly one hour drive back north, with one final piece of pumpkin pie and glass milk to fill up my already satisfied stomach, my parents and I bid adieu to my grandparents, and we began our trip back home. This would be when it would happen, and it would forever be engraved in both mine and my parents' memory. Now, anyone who lives near the border today knows that there's quite a lot of activity when it comes to the drug trade. Lots of gangs and narcos traverse the area, and it's not uncommon to hear in the news about crime. Back in this time, it was fairly uncommon to hear of such incidents. And I mention this because when we began to be followed by this unmarked black SUV with all of its windows tinted, we didn't think much of it. It must have just been this random person out for a stroll, albeit this strange vehicle, I thought. It wasn't until we realized we were being followed that my dad started to get a bit worried. I remember he would drive to the side of the road to let the vehicle pass, but they wouldn't. There was even a point they almost bumped into us and could have caused us to swerve off said road. That was scary, and although this was only a couple of times, what happened soon thereafter forever left us in shock. Out of seemingly nowhere, and I really mean this was just random, we hear a gunfire, followed by the sounds of something hitting the back of our vehicle. That sent chills down all of our spines as my dad presses on the pedal and essentially now becomes a full-on NASCAR driver. A couple of more rounds were heard hitting our vehicle, and even one shattered our back glass window, and after what seemed like an eternity, the unmarked SUV pulled off into the dark and lonely desert and drove away, never to be seen again. We ended up driving straight to the police department, but that's not of course without my mom and I shaking and crying from pure fear. I remember my dad trying his absolute best not to show how scared he was, but I knew deep down he wanted to scream. Thank God, none of us were hurt, and apart from needing to get the car fixed, we were just very thankful to be alive. As I mentioned, we never did see that vehicle again, and to this day we have no clue to what we could have done to have caused this, but we do believe without a doubt that this had to be something to do with the cartel mistaking us for someone else. It's just so crazy to think that one of those bullets could have hit one of us. An experience that I sure hope no one ever has to go through whatsoever. This happened during spring break of 2010 when my family and I went to Mexico. That year, my family and I rented one of those large vans that could fit up to 10 people. These are the kinds you see large families traveling in anytime they're going on road trips. We had spent a day road tripping out in the countryside after spending some time in Jalisco. Since we were still about 8 hours from my aunt and uncle's house, we had decided we would stay at a motel in this small town out in the middle of nowhere. Now I can't recall the exact name, but I do remember it being one of those typical small towns where there was more wilderness than people. It was about 7pm, and I remember the storm clouds beginning to descend into the valley next to us. With the sound of thunder in the near distance, we had checked into our rooms and we began to relax after being in the car all day. Let me quickly describe this motel. The motel had about, I'd say, 10 rooms. Each back to back and the building formed a sort of L shape. In the middle were two pools, which at the time were unoccupied. As for who was staying in each room, it was my sister, myself, and my three other cousins in one room, and the adults were in the other room at the very far end. At around 8pm, we decided we would go ahead and go into the pool for a bit to cool off from the warm and humid August evening. I remember we swam around as we went over the amazing sights we had seen throughout the day. I don't remember how long it was into the swimming, but we do recall seeing these two men who were dressed up in dark clothing with hoodies as they stood at the corner of the building, staring right over in our direction. At first we didn't mind them too much. But after about 15 minutes of them just standing and staring and talking on their cell phones, it did make us pretty nervous. After all, they were acting really suspicious and never once left the spot they were standing in. 
I should mention that this was during a time when you weren't really hearing about crime. It's not until recently you start hearing things about drug cartels, trafficking, shootings, and even kidnapping as well. But anyway, back to this time. We were still so scared that we decided to head back to the rooms. Of course, us being the naive teenagers we were, we never did mention it to anyone. Besides, there had to have been an explanation and maybe things would have settled down. That wouldn't be the case, however, later that evening. By now, it's around, I'd say, 2 a.m., and there's a light rain hitting the windows of our rooms. Everybody else was asleep, and I was up playing FIFA on my PlayStation Portable. Seemingly out of nowhere, I could hear the sounds of something moving. I listened in, but I ignored it after the sound disappeared about 10 seconds later. Huh, must be the rain. Or, you know, maybe this is a sign I should head off to sleep. I'm starting to hear things. Sorry, FIFA. You're gonna have to wait till tomorrow. I turned off the game, but once again, the noise started. Curious about this, I get out of bed and I head over to where I think I hear the noise. As I turn into the hallway, I'm now in full view of the front door. This is where I'm able to see that the doorknob is beginning to move. Abren por favor. Somos seguridad. Necesitamos entrar su habitación ahora mismo. An eerie voice says. Translated, this was... Open up. This is security. We need to enter your room right this instant. Normally, I would have just opened it right away, but the way the person sounded sure made it seem like they weren't really security. Also, remember, here I am with my family in a small town out in the middle of Nowheresville, and it being this late at night sure added to my suspicions. Thankfully, I do the smart thing. I go and head back to the room, and I now get on the phone, where I call the front desk. Unfortunately, no answer. And this is when moments later, I start hearing kicking at the door. By now, my cousin started to wake up, and now we're all confused as to what's going on. All this noise goes on for about three minutes, then finally it just stops. From here, all falls silent as we hear the sound of car tires screeching away. Thankfully, and finally, somebody answers the front desk telephone. Naturally, the conversation is in Spanish, but I'll go ahead and write it out in English just to make things easier, and that way you don't have to keep translating back and forth. Hi, we were just wondering, did you send security guards to our room? because they were kicking at our door and telling us to open up. Sorry, but we never did send anybody. Are you sure you weren't just hearing things? No, I'm sure. Can you send somebody to come and check, please? They do send an actual security guard, and when they arrive, the front desk lady tells us it's okay to open the door. I open it, and here standing in front of us was one of the kind security guards we had seen earlier when we got here. It's now that our parents and the adults step out of their rooms due to all the commotion and noise. All we were able to find were a bunch of marks on the door, as well as imprints from the boots kicking at the door. The whole entire thing was such a huge disturbance that we actually ended up packing our things, and we ended up leaving. I'll tell ya, my uncle was a real champion for driving with only 4 hours of sleep. As for who exactly those so-called security guards were, we don't know. But we did end up hearing about something very gruesome happening there a couple of weeks later. We were now back home in California, and school had now started. One afternoon during dinner, my mom mentioned she had a conversation with my uncle over the phone. It turned out that in that same town, at that same hotel, some cartel members ended up breaking into somebody's room. And well, you can imagine the rest. They were shot up, and unfortunately, there were casualties. Hearing those details really sent chills down our spine, especially considering we were there not too long after that shooting took place. So, the question still remains. Were those two that tried to break into a room part of the cartel? Or was this something completely unrelated? Not sure. But it is something I'll think about anytime I'm home alone or I'm by myself. Out of all the countless hours I've spent listening to The Creepy Fox, as well as other scary stories narrators, I've almost never heard of this kind of experience happening to people. After it took place, I looked up some articles and even some news reports, and I was quite shocked at how common of an occurrence this is. 
this is the kind of scary experience that leaves you at a loss of words and thinking to yourself, wow, what did I just listen to? I think the lack of help you can get to resolve this is what makes this even worse. You just don't really get the justice that's deserved for people who apparently dedicate themselves to doing these sorts of actions. But now that I've spent a few moments hyping up my story, and I've hopefully gotten your attention, I want to rewind to 2020, May. The lockdowns are in full effect, and everyone and their mothers are hunkered down in their homes, ordering takeout, only going out for groceries and medications. I myself, being happily married and a father of two wonderful children, was blessed enough to be able to work from home in my office pretty much spending every day, Monday to Friday, working on documents, as well as scheduling appointments for clients. I remember it being a Thursday afternoon because that was the day my wife was working 12 hours. She's a registered nurse and works at the local hospital, which, as you probably already guessed, was jam-packed with sick patients. My kids were over at my sister-in-law's house, and I'm just there munching on some Chex Mix and reading an email I received from one of my co-workers. Out of nowhere, however, I see the screen turn on on my phone, and I notice it's a really long phone number. Now, I normally almost never answer phone calls from numbers I don't recognize, but for whatever reason, I decided to answer anyway, most likely because I was pretty bored and I just wanted to get my mind off of my work. So, as soon as I answered the phone, palms and fingers still oily and salty from my crunchy snacks, I'm hit with a very aggressive voice. This is going to pretty much be what I remember the conversation going like, so the wording isn't going to be exact, but you get the idea. I answered, Hello? Who's this? Hey, do you speak Spanish? I answered no, telling him I barely remember the words I was taught in my high school Spanish class, and all of a sudden he starts yelling in Spanish. This is then followed by a lot of vulgarities in English. Then a line that made my heart drop. We have your wife. Do as we say, and I promise nothing will happen to her. Then I heard the scream of a woman in the background, crying for help and yelling out things that were hard to understand. The man begins to speak again and tells me that if I weren't to wire him $10,000 within the next hour, I would never hear from my wife again. You can already imagine the scene. I'm shaking heart racing like a race car in NASCAR, and I'm desperately trying to catch my breath. Please, no, put her back on the line. Don't do anything to my Marianne. Obviously, that's not her real name. I'm just making one up for this story. Regardless, I made the foolish mistake of saying her name. I begged. I cried like I'd never done so in my life, as he begins explaining the process of wiring money to him. All the while, I'm starting to think, my wife was at the hospital. How in the world could she have been kidnapped by someone who is now demanding money? I don't know, but I foolishly grab my car keys and begin walking outside into the driveway. In that very moment, my sister-in-law is pulling up with my kids, and she sees the look of complete panic and fear in my eyes. The man on the line asks me who I was talking to, and goes further to say that if it was the police, that was it. In that moment, I put my phone on mute, and I tell my sister-in-law somebody had kidnapped my wife. She looks at me, and then she explains that she had just spoken to her no less than three minutes ago to advise her the kiddos were being taken back to me. Still on mute, I tell my sister-in-law who was calling, and that's when she says, She's fine. Hang up, and let's call the police. The man on the line is asking me why I wasn't speaking, and then begins to curse at me once again. This is when I finally hung up, and I immediately phoned for my wife, who answered me on the second ring. Thank the Lord, she was fine. She was on her break about to go back to work, actually. I gave her a quick Spark Notes version on what had just occurred, and she manages to calm me down, my kids staring at me like I was some sort of madman. Long story short, I phoned the police, and I explained what had happened word for word, and the police officer I spoke to tells me that it was an extortion scam. She explained that this was a common occurrence, and criminals in Mexican jails will bribe the security guards for cell phones, 
and then they'll dial random phone numbers until they successfully connect with someone. Then, using a recording of a woman screaming for help, they trick you into thinking that they have one of your loved ones, finally demanding money. I couldn't believe it, but as I mentioned before, I looked this up online and the articles, videos on YouTube, and experiences I read were almost identical to mine. So that's pretty much the whole story. I have never received a phone call like that ever again and I now have a filter set up on my phone which blocks international calls as well as spam. Has anyone listening ever had this kind of experience happen to them? Or do you know anyone that might have? It would be interesting to see if any of my fellow Creepy Fox listeners have a story to share that's similar to mine. This next story was featured on a previous episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast. It involves a scary story with a sicario. It does go with a theme of cartel, so I figured that this would be a perfect fit, especially for those of you who only watch and listen to my cartel stories videos, otherwise you might have missed it. Anyway, here it is. I'm keeping some of these details vague because I seriously don't want the host to find out that I published this story. I don't think they would approve. I hope this is alright and I'll try to still make it as comprehensible as possible. I spent a year studying in Mexico recently, and as you do on exchange, I tried to travel as much as I could. Between the semesters, there is a big break, and me and my buddy that I spent the most time with during the exchange decided we'd go on a longer backpacking trip through Mexico together. We had a rough plan on where to go and what we wanted to see, but we hadn't even booked our flight back yet, nor were we sure from where we would take it from. We wanted to keep it flexible. We had an amazing time, and a few days before our trip ended, we finally decided we would take our flight from a city that was close and had really cheap flights, but the city itself didn't really have anything to offer. Then on Airbnb, we found a room very close to the airport in a house with a pool and we thought we'd just treat ourselves to a relaxed pool day at the end of the trip. It turned out the hosts were a family. The husband was Mexican and the wife was from Europe and could even speak our native language. So we arranged that we would take a bus to the airport and they would pick us up from there. When we finally arrived at the city, it was already dark and the bus driver refused to drive us to the airport since it was not directly on his route, so he just dropped us off on the highway. That was already a pretty crappy situation to begin with, standing with our backpacks at the side of the road, in the middle of nowhere, in a not so safe city in Mexico. But I called the hosts and sent them our GPS location, and they say no problem, they will come to get us. So the husband came to pick us up, and it was a very uncomfortable situation getting into the car, especially with a stranger in the night in the middle of nowhere. It also didn't help that the guy looked like Danny Trejo without a mustache, and as I tried to make small talk with him, he only gave us monosyllabic answers or straight out ignored me. Well, he's just not a big talker, I thought, and hoped we would arrive soon. Looking back, I can see a million red flags, but for some reason at the time we just didn't see them. Either we were too tired, or to be honest, we didn't really have any other choice than going along anyway. But yes, we arrive, and that should have immediately set alarms off. We were in the middle of nowhere. There were fields with sheep and goats around, and all of a sudden, a gravel road branches off from the paved road. And along that gravel road, there are about six huge mansions, all mind you, with two meter walls around them, topped with NATO fence, huge gates, and at least two gigantic guard dogs per house. When we entered the house, we were greeted by the wife, a bubbly middle-aged woman that was very talkative but pleasant. She had actually cooked dinner for us and we ate while exchanging small talk. The husband just sat at the table not saying a single word. 
After dinner, we more or less went directly to bed because it had gotten late and we were tired from a long day. The next morning we saw that the weather was not that good, so we decided to go into town and just see the few touristy things it had to offer instead of spending it at the pool. When we came back, it was already dark but we decided to jump into the pool anyway to cool off because it was very hot and humid. The wife joined us, and at some point my friend made the mistake to ask how they were able to afford such a house. It didn't really match the price range of the jobs they were telling us that they were doing, and she deflected a bit and added that her husband was very handy because he had grown up in the streets and basically built the house himself. We realized that it maybe was not the best topic, and broke the conversation off. That was the last day of our trip and we had our flight back home early the next morning. We still had some weed left that we had bought on the trip and we thought it would be nice to smoke one out since it was our last night. However, since this was a family home and they had kids around, we thought it would be better to speak to our hosts if they would mind. So later in the evening we asked the wife if it would be okay if we smoked on the terrace which for some reason she found quite amusing and started laughing. She shouted to her husband who was lying on the couch watching TV, My love, the boys ask if it would be okay if they smoke some weed. What do you think? And he just laughed but didn't give an answer. We looked at her with a dumbfounded expression and she told us sure, just go ahead. So we went to the terrace and start smoking our joint. Later, they joined us and we just had a chat. And this is where things got really messed up. For some reason, they start asking all sorts of questions about the weed, where we got it, how much it was, who we got it from, and how much we would have to pay for that back in Europe. They just seemed way too interested in the weed. And at one point, the wife just nonchalantly revealed to us, yes, we thought about doing that as a source of income, selling weed. But too many people die doing that because the cartels don't like that. Actually, my husband used to kill people for doing that. I immediately felt sober. Did she just say, and as if he read my mind, her husband added, Yes, when I was about 16, I killed a lot of people for the cartel for money. And he said it in a tone as if he had just said he used to mow lawns when he was a teenager. I still thought I must have misunderstood, so I texted my friend who was sitting across the table from me, trying not to make eye contact, because I knew we would freak each other out. He confirmed that I had indeed understood right. We discuss what we should do, and agree that there's no immediate threat, and that we should just stay. We don't have anywhere else to go anyway, and it's already late. But things got even crazier. We try to keep our composure and not completely freak out, while still making conversation with our hosts. A few minutes later though, the husband got up and went inside to get something. And he came back with a literal kilo of weed, pressed into a brick. He now proceeded to break bits off the brick and roll them into a joint that would most likely have knocked out Snoop Dogg. It was about the size of my thumb, and I guess it had about two grams of weed in there. Of course, he offered the joint to us, but we politely declined saying that we were already pretty stoned. He seemed a little bit offended, but fortunately, he bought our excuse. But it got even worse. A few minutes later, we hear a couple of loud bangs. The wife became a bit uneasy and asked, What was that? To which he answered calmly, Nine millimeters. That confirmed my suspicions that indeed I heard gunshots. I would say it was around seven or something gunshots, fired pretty quickly after each other. The wife got nervous and asked if we should maybe go inside, and says, What do you think they're shooting at? In the air? At cows? At people? But he just shrugged it off and we stayed outside. Again, a few minutes later there were more shots, this time even closer. The wife got even more upset and asked again, should we maybe go inside? What do you think they're shooting at? Should we go inside? And I think I will never forget when he answered in the most calmest way imaginable. No, everything's okay. 
I didn't hear any screams yet. I don't know why, but the way he just calmly said that freaked me the hell out and is still making my heart beat whenever I think about it. After that, we quickly excused ourselves and went to our room. When we finally could talk, we basically both lost it and panicked. What the hell were we supposed to do? We are locked into a house with a contract killer in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and people are shooting outside. We decided it was probably our best bet to stay, because we thought, well, we are his guests, he's not going to harm us, hopefully, and it's better to have walls and dogs, and a serial killer in between us and people shooting around. So we barricaded ourselves in the room and didn't sleep a single second until the morning when we noped the hell out of there and went to the airport. I was never so happy to be patted down at security my whole life. Hi there creepy fox, huge fan of yours from Mexico here. For privacy reasons, I don't want to give out names nor talk about too many specifics, primarily for mine and my family's safety, but I thought I would still tell you about this and hopefully you can share this story since it's not just something that has happened to us. Hope that this can raise some awareness. Now this has been happening all across Mexico to law abiding good citizens who are just trying to make ends meet and live their lives in peace. Ever heard of the word extortion? If you don't know what that means, it basically involves you getting what you want by violent means. It's what the cartel in Mexico are well known for, especially the smaller ones that aren't really funded that well. It's not surprising to have cartel members show up to your business and then basically tell you, give us a portion of your revenue, otherwise we're going to come after you and your family. Sadly, when businesses don't listen to these threats, that can then lead to family members getting kidnapped, and then that's a whole other story of its own. Anyway, it's a quick entry here, but this is what happened. It was 2018, and my dad and I were on his property out in the countryside, where he grows up by us as a family business. It was actually passed on to him by his father, my grandfather, and it was supposed to be passed on to me. But that's until this happened. We were taking a break from the hot summer sun and we were having some sandwiches that my mom had packed for us as we drank some ice cold agua fresca. That's when two trucks drove down the road. Since we're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere, we did find their arrival quite odd since my dad knows everybody who comes out here. He didn't know anyone with that make or model of trucks. Well, some armed men came out of the truck and then start to walk over to us. I got really spooked and I could tell my dad was doing his best not to act scared as he tells me to stay behind him as to protect me from these armed men. We don't want any trouble, my dad said with a shaking voice. Relax, we don't want any trouble either, but there will be trouble if you don't do as we say. A long story short, the men identify themselves from one of the local cartel. Still don't know why they told us that, but I think maybe so that hearing that detail, we would end up complying. But basically they told us that they wanted to have a portion of the profits that my dad was making from the papaya business, and if he didn't comply, it wasn't going to end well for any of us. My dad, being the tough guy he was, called them out on this bluff. And this is when one of them tells him, Is this your son? You better do as we say, or we're taking him with us. After that threat, my dad complied. I mean, they do have guns, what are we going to do? And basically from there, they would return a couple of times a month to check up on things and take the money that we were making. Basically, doing all that hard work for nothing. Oh, and in case you might be asking why we didn't just get the police involved, Although, I'm sure those of you who are saying that are listeners from the US, sadly, it doesn't work that way here in Mexico. I'd say a good 95% of the police are in cahoots with the cartel, and they get bribed to turn a blind eye. It's sad, really. Anyway, after about a year of living in constant fear, my dad and I drove over to the property one morning, 
only to see that our entire field of papayas, as well as other fruit, had been set ablaze. This was also around the time we had stopped hearing from that group of men and seen them. And as of today, September 2022, we haven't heard a single thing from them. We are almost certain that they were the ones responsible for setting it all ablaze, since we had no other enemies, nor have we had any. We actually still have a little food business, and we're actually getting by just fine right now, so that's a good thing. Anyway, I just wanted to end by saying thank you for what you do, Creepy Fox. Your videos and your stories are what helped me get by. Take care of yourself, friend, and all the best.